Act 3, Scene 2 in 5 minutes. Act 3, Scene 2 is another between Macbeth and Lady Macbeth, but it shows the very much the change in dynamics between them, the different way that they react and, and deal with each other. Basically, Macbeth is now much more in charge. Um, it starts with Lady Macbeth and the servant having a conversation uh, together, uh, and then Lady Macbeth is left for a few lines on her own, in which she reveals that, like Lady, like Macbeth before, she is not happy. She talks about how she is not content, and that she is now dwelling in doubtful joy. Again, an oxymoron that suggests that there's a sense of disappointment to what she's managed to achieve. But then when Macbeth comes in, again, she takes a different view. Having a go at him, maybe not having a go, but kind of telling him not to look so dark and keep himself all on his own. Macbeth, does, all the way through this, doesn't seem to listen to her. He doesn't respond to what she asks him. He's just thinking about his own problems. He points out that we've scorched the snake, not killed it. Okay, it will close and come back. We need to do more. All we've done is damage the snake, the evil. It's interesting that he's turned the snake now onto the other side against him as though he's the person of good. Um, he reveals that he's got terrible dreams that shake him nightly, how much he's still suffering, um, especially with his sleep. And he shows some envy for Duncan actually being dead, because at least he's sleeping well, and nothing can touch him further. Lady Beth continues to try and reassure him. He comes back to this idea that we've had, we haven't had for a little while now, this thing of faces and hearts the difference of the inside to before. When he says make her face is visards to her hearts, visards are the part of a suit of armour that people wear over their face, those big, heavy things that cover them up. So our faces need to cover up the truth of our hearts and almost be a defence against them. When Nameth tells him, you've got to leave this, you know, for your own good, all he responds is that his mind is full of scorpions, a lovely, uh, uh, really well put together image. Um, his mind stinging him away all the time here. He points out to her, you do know Banquo and his flowers are still alive. She replies, they won't live forever. That's what in the nature copy is another term means. Now Beth seems again not to have listened to her, just says, yep, it's okay, there's some comfort, we can get to them. Not really listen to her point at all. And goes back into one of these detailed responses about the dark and evil. She wants to know what's to be done. He, interestingly, says, be innocent of the knowledge, dearest Chuck, till you applaud the deed. Now, there's several things going on here. One, is he showing off? Is he, wants, is he wanting her approval? That's why he wants her to not know, so she can um, say how wonderful he is for it. Is he trying to protect her? A kind of comical thing, really, when you think about how she took control in the first place. But at the same time, a lot of people think they're getting more distant here. But look at the term of love he uses for her. He then once again calls on the night to come and take over the day, just as we've had before. Uh, wants uh, it to, uh, uh, to come and tear to pieces the bond that keeps him pale, the bond between him and... Uh, um, Banquo, I think. He brings up images of the crow and the rook, dark birds, a lot of birds in this, um, dark birds that are associated with death, and then comments that Lady Macbeth seems to be marvelling at his words. She seems to be shocked by what he's saying, or worried by what he's saying. Maybe she realises what he's going to do and thinks it will be a disaster. But we see the change.